Hello and welcome back to the Jacksonville History Show. I'm Emily Liska, Executive Director of the Jacksonville Historical Society. And in this segment, I have with me Jacksonville native Alton Yates. And Alton is here to share some of his uh, memories of growing up in Jacksonville and uh, excerpts from his life in Jacksonville, Florida, some riveting. Welcome, Alton. Thank you. And not to, st not to suggest other parts of your life aren't riveting as well. <laughs> um, out in goodness, you're Jacksonville native. You attended local schools. Um, let's see, refresh me. Tell me the schools you attended. Lavella Elementary. Yes, Lavella Elementary was located on Church Street at that mm -hmm. time. A.L. Lewis Junior mm -hmm. High School and Stanton High School. In fact, all within walking distance of my home in Lavella. Uh, and what street did you live on in Lavella? I lived on Everson Street, and Everson Street is the street, by the way, that uh, A.L. Lewis Junior High School was on. Initially, it was called Lavella School, and then it became A.L. Lewis, named after Dr. A.L. Lewis, who founded the Afro-American Life Insurance Company at American Beach. And because you look like a million dollars, I'm going to say that you graduated from Stanton in 1954. That's correct. And you went on to join the Air Force. Yes. And that experience became really uh, pivotal, or what happened following that experience, to your commitment to civil rights in Jacksonville and on a wider scale. And we have some uh, photographs of uh, your early days in the Air Force. And I really wish you would talk about, I'm going, here's one right here, Alton. You were involved in uh, the, an experimental space program uh, for our country, and I want you to talk about this a little. Yes, those were the early days of the space program. In fact, that photo was taken in 1955, I believe. It is a, a picture of me riding one of the rocket sleds. We use rocket sleds to test the effects of rapid acceleration and deceleration on the human body because at that time, no one knew what kind of pressures or forces were going to be exerted on the human body when we reached the point where we could put a man into space. And there you are again in that yes, kind of lying sideways. Yes, that's in that another one of the rocket sleds, yes. And those sleds would travel on tracks that were similar to railroad tracks to speeds up to a thousand miles <gasps> an hour. Oh gracious. And in fact, the colonel whom I worked for, who still holds the title of the fastest man on earth, was Colonel John Paul Stapp. And he rode the sled at 632 miles an hour and stopped in one and nine tenths seconds. What we were able to determine from those sleds, in addition to the uh, data that we got for the space program, those were the initial tests that determined that seat belts should be used in automobiles and in fact the Ford Motor Company had a contract with our laboratory and they knew that we were doing these rocket sled tests and so they asked us to test the efficacy of seat belts and the use of seat belts of you know perhaps the use of seat belts in automobiles so we determined from that that seat belts were the safest way to ride in an automobile. We also determined from those tests that the safest way to travel on an airliner was if the seats in the airplane were facing backward and you were strapped in. That on impact with crash, you would stand a much better chance of survival. But unfortunately, the, the air pay, fear paying public, mm -hmm. not going to be seated backwards riding a commercial airliner. So that's not going to happen. So that part didn't come to fruition. Occasionally no. on a flight, you will get those uh, facing seats. On a rare occasion, I've seen them on some yes. uh, airlines. One, one of the things I will mention then, so, so basically your involvement in, in these experiments, uh, they, it, it was death defying. I mean, this, this, you risk your life doing this oh, yes. uh, for research to simulate uh, space travel. Exactly. What we had to do was try to find out everything that would happen to the human body. We needed to know the effects of rapid acceleration and deceleration. We needed to learn whether or not the body's exposure to cosmic mm -hmm. radiation was going to have a problem. And in order to do that, we flew high altitude balloons. Uh, we had to find ways to eject out of high speed aircraft. So we did the seat 
crash studies, the ejection seat test. And I was involved in those kinds of tests. This was mm -hmm. just before uh, the creation of NASA. We were involved in those kinds of tests, well, myself, for four and a half years. And I was awarded uh, the Air Force Commendation Medal, and I received a citation for having risked my life more than 65 times for science. You can imagine how proud I was to be involved in that kind of program. All the people who were involved at that time were volunteers. No one had to do that. The only way you could participate in that program was if you were willing to volunteer to do those hazardous tests. And there were about seven of us who were involved at that time. Well, I received word that my father was, was very ill and I needed to come home, cut short my Air Force career. And you might imagine, uh, after having done all those kinds of things, having seen uh, my picture in magazines all over the country, and being awarded the medals that I had, that I was a pretty proud young Jacksonville mm -hmm. native. So I got into my dress blue uniform, jumped into my car, and was going to drive the 12 or 1300 miles from Holloman Air Force Base, New Mexico, back to Jacksonville. And this was in October of 1959. When I left the base, my first stop from the base was El Paso, Texas, which was about 90 miles away from, from the base at Alamogordo. Um, this secret base out in the middle of the desert was Holloman Air Force Base, which to this day is still one of the secret bases. But at any rate, my first stop was, was uh, El Paso, Texas, and I went into a restaurant to eat. There was a gas station at the restaurant. I you know, filled my car with gas for my journey home. And I walked into the restaurant to sit down and eat, you know, in preparation for my journey home. Before I could be seated, the waitress told me, she says, we don't, I don't think you can be served in here, but let me get the manager. And the manager came out from back of the restaurant and said, I'm sorry, but we don't serve, and he used the N-word in our restaurant, says you have to go out back. I can't imagine, you know, the feeling that came over me at that time. Here I am, someone who had just done all these things over the past four and a half years of my life. At, and believe me, at Holloman, we had absolutely no signs of segregation whatsoever. In other places in the country where we went to launch balloons, I learned later on that, for example, we launched our balloons from Minnesota. We went to a place called Crosby in Ironton, Minnesota, because they had these deep, abandoned mm -hmm. iron mines. And you could inflate this helium-inflated uh, balloon, and you could get it up without it being torn off. And we, our balloons you know, went into the stratosphere. Well, what I learned later on was that before I arrived at those places, the Air Force always sent an advanced team in to be sure that its black troops were not going to have any problems oh. in those towns. I didn't know that until much later on. So anywhere we went, I didn't encounter any prejudice or discrimination. You know, all the people were exceptionally nice. I couldn't imagine being treated this way in El Paso, Texas, which itself is a fairly big military town. But from that point on, for the 1,200-mile journey, everywhere I stopped, to use a restroom or to eat at a service station, I was refused. I could buy the gas, but they would refuse me service. So I decided that when I got back to Jacksonville, I was going to do something about it. I was, I guess I was wise enough to know that I really shouldn't make an issue out of it on the road by myself at that time, and I didn't. People generally ask me, well, did you get angry at that treatment? I got angry, but I had sense enough not to show the anger. Now, sadly, with this very compelling story, we have about four or five minutes left at the most. We're going to fast forward. You've come. Now you've arrived in Jacksonville, overshadowing this, this, this shocking experience, this mm -hmm. surprising experience. And you're here. And if we can tell what unfolds your involvement here with the Civil Rights okay. Movement. 
As soon as I arrived in Jacksonville, I began to seek out the NAACP because I knew that that mm -hmm. was one of the active organizations in the area. And you're only, what, 22 years old, maybe? Yes, 20. I was 22 mm -hmm. at that okay. time. I sought out uh, the NAACP president, who at that time was Earl Johnson, and he told me that a school teacher whose name was Rutledge Pearson was in mm -hmm. the process of trying to organize a group of youngsters and they were going to be doing sit-in demonstrations. And we have some photographs of this we'll, yeah. we'll go to as you keep talking. And that's You're exactly what I decided I wanted to do. I wanted to get involved in the sit-in demonstrations. And let's say sit-in where? Tell this more specifically. This is at Woolworth's lunch counter, which was in downtown Jacksonville. In fact, the federal courthouse sits on that spot now. But that's the lunch counter at Woolworth, and these were young people who were members of the NAACP Youth Council and we sat in at the lunch counters at Woolworth, at, mm -hmm. at uh, W.T. Grant Store, and Crest. And there you are to the left yes, of the screen. Yes, that's me to the left, and Rodney Hurst is mm -hmm, sitting there mm -hmm. next to me, and we were talking to some of the reporters mm -hmm. and news people who had gathered there. They wanted to know why we were there. Just to have the right to eat yeah. lunch. <laughs> well, and, and actually it was yes. more than that. It was okay. more than, it, than just that. Mm -hmm. we, we were welcome to shop in those stores, but we were not welcome to sit and take a break and have lunch. So it was trying to win the right to equal access and equal opportunity that was foremost mm -hmm. in our minds mm -hmm. at that time. And of course, we, we went on from Woolworth and Grant and, and Sears, and there was a Sears store downtown. We had tremendous demonstrations there. And right across the park was uh, the May Coins apartment. So actually it was Coin Brothers at that time. Later it became the May department store. And, mm -hmm. and we only have about one minute left. And if you'll look at the screen, what evolved on August? The August 27th, 1960 was Axe Handle Day, and that's the day when a group of men met us at Woolworth, and they were around Hemming Plaza handing out the Axe Handles, and one group of marchers went down to the W.T. Grant store, my group went to the Woolworth store. These men met us and started beating us with these Axe Handles. We learned that they were members of the Ku Klux Klan who had they knew that we were going to be there because we had been demonstrating almost every Saturday morning until that time. And they decided that they had a surprise for us. So they came in and they started beating us with the axe handles, thinking that that would kill the movement. Unfortunately, we couldn't fight back, but there was a group called the Boomerangs, and they came in and kind of gave us some protection, beating them off of us. And. Alton, on that note, sadly, we're going to have to leave. We have to have you back. This is a riveting story, a riveting time in Jacksonville's history. And from this, of course, there is the rest of the story where the civil rights movement did make headway in Jacksonville because yes. of your efforts and so many others. I want to thank everybody for being with the Jacksonville History Show, particularly you, Alton, and join us next time. In the meantime, catch us on www.jackshistory.com. That's all for now.